So good afternoon, January 19, 2015. This is MATV 150, Section 1, Conference 1. Today is the first class in the first week of the semester. So let's get started. Well, welcome back. Remember, this is week number three. And starting from last week, I have already installed the before class, during class, after class, and end with exercise, or there is a suggested practices. So if you go back to um, the before class of last week, which I'm going to do it for this week, for next particular class on Thursday, you know that I have given you uh, informations like this, okay? And hopefully, some of you have already emailed them, and if you can share with me, how many of you have already done this page? Could you raise your hand? Okay, that's good. A very honest class. We have not done this at all. Now, remember, um, you have to submit your first homework, okay? On Wednesday, okay? And then you're going to have a quiz next Wednesday, okay? Remember, the quiz material is related to several sections we're covered. So, in order to look up what is going to cover in the quiz, where are you going to look into in a little bit about? Okay, let me answer your first question first. First, in order to know what is going to be covered in your first quiz, you need to go back to the first teacher's message, okay? Right here. And in the first teacher's message, you have a very specific context on when you're going to submit your homework. The first one is to be submitted on January the 21st, that means this coming Wednesday is based on sections 2.1, section 2.2, section 2.3 of the textbook. And all together you're going to have 11 questions or problems to solve. Okay? And then your first quiz is going to be scheduled on January the 28th which is again on Wednesday, is based on sections 2.2 and 2.3, okay? So sections 2.2 and sections 2.3, okay? So 2.2 is basically something about the limit concept, okay? And 2.3, it's more about the limits concept, okay? I've already got some questions on that already. And so 2.2 and 2.3 are the two sections you have to review very carefully in order to get the limits concept clarified. All right, and starting from this week, we are going to study the derivative according to the schedule of the syllabus. That means we're actually moving into something about chapter three. Okay, but if you are very careful enough and you know that we have already started your study on chapter three on week number one. All right? Oh yes, I need to answer this very important question. Many of you have already asked me through email. Um, according to the syllabus, you want us to do note-taking, right? Note-taking. And so if you have finished taking notes and you submit the notes, you'll got through all the semester, a total of 15 semester points. 15, okay? Now let me tell you a little bit about the, the, the process of earning your score here. First, you have to take notes on your own. Second, you need to share your notes with one learning partner from this class. You need to select one learning partner, okay? And you need to share your notes with your learning partner, and that, that means your learning partner is going to share his or her notes with you, okay? And so, during the semester, I'm going to collect the notes from... Okay, I, I thought about this, but I, this is my decision at this point. Okay, you are going to have um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight quizzes. So I'm going to collect the notes eight times, okay? So I would say uh, one day after your quiz, will be the time you need to submit your notes. So the first time, you're going to submit your notes electronically, definitely. And you need to scan your notes in a PDF. And it will be one day after January the 28th, one day after February the 4th, one day. Uh, I don't think this is too close. 
I will set a different day here at least two widths or something like this. So it will be something like that. I'm going to give you um, relatively clear schedule when I run my teacher's message from last week today. Okay? So the, how, how does it work? First of all, you need to take notes based on the textbook or based on the material on the website. And then you write back a very good set of notes. And definitely, you, you need to choose your learning partner. And you need to share your notes with your learning partner. And your learning partner is going to share his of the notes with you. And the two of you are going to combine one set of notes to submit. So the two of you will receive the same grade for your notes. Okay? It's going to be their work. All right? So what you need to do before the end of this week is you need to make sure who is going to be your learning partner, okay? Who is going to be your learning partner? So you need to take notes. You need to share the notes with your learning partner. You need to submit the notes with your learning partner together. Uh, when the grade of note is returned, both of you in your pair will receive the same notes grade, okay? So that will be very meaningful because you need to learn how to work it out with your learning partner. Okay, any complaints about this? Is it good? Is it okay? Any objections? Now you can tell me secretly through Dr. Van Stewart and hotline, and let's work it out, okay? You don't want to tell me directly. And because we're still in the process of implementing this. The reason why I need to um, to have you do the notes together as a pair is because you always have someone to talk to. Okay? You always have someone to talk to. And that is very important in the context of learning. So I'm going to give you a schedule on submitting your notes. Normally, it's every two to three weeks, or every two weeks. It's covering eight times, okay? Eight sets of notes throughout the semester. Okay, are you ready for today's class? Yes, thank you. Oh, the journal is actually the notes. You do not need to submit a weekly journal. The weekly journal means is a means for you to keep track of your learning uh, through the electronic journals, which is convenient for you in a modern environment. The notes that you're going to submit is going to give you a grade, and that will be through the official submissions like this. Okay? So do you understand the meaning of that? All right. And um, I can also set up what we call a peer discussion forum for the two of you who's going to do the notes together so that you can always have the convenience of over the modern environment to talk to one another, okay? And that will be very good, very good. All right, now let's get back to some of the questions I received from you um, after, after last week's classes, okay? So now, because of the same of time, I've already given you uh, a very good set of answers through um, one, two, three, the first three names here, okay? Click on the, this is a very basic, I think you don't need it, but uh, still, I think many of you, if you need the answer, you come back here, but limits infinity, limits and continuity. If you need help, particular thing, you ask me questions about that. It's very soft, seven minutes here, and eight minutes here, okay? Watch, and that should solve your problem, okay? But today, let's move back to the big picture. We're going to study the popper contacts of the derivative. Now, may I ask you this question? What have you remember at the end of chapter one? What does section 1.5 say? I need to ask you this question. When you read sections 1.5, it tells you there are two fundamental problems in the calculus. One is concerned with the tangent line. The other is concerned with the area. Now, what is meant by tangent line? When we talk about the tangent, it's talking about the slope, okay? The slope of something, the slope of a line, tangent to a particular curve with a specific functions, okay? And what does the tangent, or what does the slope mean? It has something to do with the rate of change of something, okay, in calculus. And when we deal with the tangent line problem, the slope prediction problem in calculus, we are actually looking for a specific function, which is called the slope function, from a given function, which tells us something very 
may spread space, such as at a particular point, the distant triangle heads, at a particular year, the growth in the height of a person heads, which is consumed, assuming uh, we have a constant rate of change. But what if we want to look at an instantaneous changing rate of change? But that is something to do with differential calculus. And remember, I told you to look at a specific page in your chapter, in your book, which tells you the derivative of a particular function is derived from given functions through understanding how we can work out the slope function. So understanding how to work out the slope functions at a particular point in time is actually the derivative of something. All right, let me give you a 30 minutes time for those of you who are honest enough, you have already done your review, be patient with the other persons in this class. But those of you who have not done this, make sure you pay attention to the following 30 minutes. Okay? Let's bring back Professor Hubert Stein. Hubert Stein, okay? Let me make sure the voice is okay. Because the video quality is good, the voice is. All right, relationship. Let's make a good review in 30 minutes. Please pay attention. Okay, hi. Uh, this is the second in my videos about the main ideas, the big picture of calculus. And this is an important one because I want to introduce and compute some derivatives. And you remember the overall situation is we have, a, we have pairs of functions, distance and speed, function one and function two, height of a graph, slope of the graph, height of a mountain, slope of a mountain. And it's the connection between those two that, that, that calculus is about. And so our problem today is, you could imagine we have a, 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 an airplane climbing. Its height is y as it covers a distance x. And the flight recorder will well, it probably it has two flight recorders, let's suppose it has. Or uh, your car has two recorders. One records the distance, the height, the total amount achieved up to that moment, up to that time t or that point x. The second recorder would be, would tell you at every instant what the speed is. So it would tell you the speed at all times. Do you see the difference? The speed is like what's happening at an instant. The distance or the height y is the total accumulation of how far you've gone, how high you've gone. And now I'm going to suppose that this speed, this second function, the recorder is lost. But the information is there and how to recover it. So that's the question. How, if I have a total record, say, of height, let me, I'll stay mostly with y of x. I write these two so that you realize that letters are not what calculus is about, it's ideas. And here's the a central idea. If, if I know the height, as I go along, I know the height it could go down. How can I recover from that height what the slope is at each point. So and here's something rather important. That's the notation that Leibniz created, and it was a good, good idea for the derivative. And you'll see where it comes from. But somehow I'm dividing height distance up by distance across. And that ratio of up to across is a slope. So let me uh, develop what, uh, what, we, what we're doing. So the one thing we can do and now will do is for a few, for the great functions of calculus, 
a few very special, very important functions, we will actually figure out what the slope is. These are given by formulas, and I'll find a formula for the slope, dy dx equals. And I won't write it in yet, let me keep a little suspense, but this short list of the great functions is tremendously valuable. The process that we go through takes a little time, but once we do it, it's done. Once we write in the answer here, we know it. And the point is that other functions of science, of engineering, of economics, of life, come from these functions by multiplying, I could multiply that times that, and then I need a product rule, a rule for the derivative, the slope of a product. I could divide that by that. And that, so I need a quotient rule. I could do a chain, and you'll see that's maybe the best and, and most valuable. E to the sine x. So I'm putting e to the x together with sine x in a chain of functions, e to the sine of x. Then we need a chain rule. That's all coming. Let me start, well, let me even start by giving away the main facts for these three examples, because there are three you want to remember, and might as well start now. The x to the nth, so that's something, if n is positive, x to the nth climbs up. Let me draw a graph here of y equal x squared, because that's one we'll work out in detail, y equal x squared. So this direction is x, this direction is y, and I want to know the slope, and the point is that that slope is changing as I go up. So the slope depends on x. The slope will be different here, so it's getting steeper and steeper. I'll figure out that slope. For this example, x squared when n is 2, and it's fine. If n was minus 2, just because that's also on our list, n could be negative, the function would be dropping. You remember x to the minus 2, that negative exponent means divide by x squared. x to the minus 2 is 1 divided by x squared, and it will be dropping. Here, so n could be positive or negative. So I tell you the derivative. The derivative is easy to remember. It's that number n. It's another power of x. And that power is one less. One, one down. You lose one power. So I, I'm going to go through the steps here for n equal to 2. So I hope to get the answer 2 times x to the 2 minus 1 will just be 1, 2x. But, but what does the slope mean? That's what this lecture is really telling you. I, 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 I'll tell you the answer for, if it's sine x going in beautifully, the derivative of sine x is cos x, the cosine. The derivative of the sine curve is the cosine curve. You could have hoped for more than that. And then, We'll also, at the same time, find the derivative of the cosine curve, which is minus the sine curve. It turns out a minus sign comes in because the cosine curve drops at the start. Okay. And would you like to know this one? Sure. E to the x, which I will introduce in a very in a lecture coming very soon, because it's the function of calculus. And the reason it's so terrific is the connection between the function, whatever it is, whatever this number e is to whatever the x power means, the slope is the same as the function, e to the x. The, that's amazing. The slope, as the function changes, the slope changes and they stay equal. Okay, that's just... Uh, Really, my help is just to say, if you know those three, you're really off to a good start, plus the rules that you need. 
All right, now I'll tackle this particular one and say, what does slope mean? Okay. So, I'm given my, my, the recorder that I have, function, this is function one. This is function one, the one I know. And I know it at every point. If I only had like the trip meter after an hour or two hours or three hours, well, calculus can't do the impossible. It can't know if I only knew the distance reached after each hour. All I could, I couldn't tell what it did over that hour, how often you had to brake, how often you accelerated. I could only find like an average speed over that hour. That would be easy. So averages don't need calculus. It's instant stuff. What happens at a moment? What is that speedometer reading at the moment? X, say x equal one. What is the slope? Yeah, let, let me let me put in x equal one on this graph and x equal two. Say and now x squared is going to be at height one when. If x is 1, then x squared is also 1. If x is 2, x squared up be 4. The, what's the average? Let me just come back one second to that average business. The average slope there would be in a distance across of 1, I went up by how much? 3. I went up from 1 to 4. I have to do a subtraction. Differences, derivatives, or that's, that's the connection here. So it's four minus one, that is three. So I would say the average is three over one. But that's not calculus. Calculus is looking at the instant thing. And let me begin at this instant, at that point. What does the slope look like to you at that, at that point? At, at x equals zero, here's x equals zero, and here's y equals zero, we're very much zero. You see it's, it's climbing, but at that moment, it's like it just started from a red light, whatever, the speed is zero at that point. And I want to say, I, I want to, uh, the slope is zero. That's flat right there. That's flat. If I continue the curve, if I continue the x squared curve for x negative, it would be the same as for x positive. Well, it doesn't look very the same. Let me improve that. It would start up the same way. It would be completely symmetric. Everybody sees that at that zero position. The curve has hit bottom. Actually, this will be a major, major application of calculus. You, you identify the bottom of a curve by the fact that the slope is zero. It's not going up, it's not going down. It's zero at that point. But now what do I mean by slope at a point? Okay, here comes the new idea. If I go way over to one, I, that's too much. That, I just want to stay near this point. I'll go over a little bit, and I call that a little bit delta x. So that letter delta signals to our mind small. Some small. I'm actually probably smaller than I grew up there. But. And then, so what's the average? I, I, I'd like to just find the average speed or average slope. If I go over by delta x, and then how high do I go up? Well, the curve is y equal x squared. So how, how high is this? So the, so the average is up first divided by across. Across is our usual delta x. How far did it go up? Well, if our curve is x squared and I'm at the point delta x, then it's delta x squared. That's the average over the over the first piece. Over short over 
the first piece of the curve. Out as from here out to delta x. Okay. Now, again, that's still only an average because delta x might have been short. I want to push it to zero. That's where calculus comes in. Taking the limit of shorter and shorter and shorter pieces in order to zoom in on that instant, that moment, that spot where we're looking at the slope and where we're expecting the answer zero in this case. And you see that the average in this, it happens to be especially simple. Delta x squared over delta x is just delta x. So the average slope is extremely small. And I'll just complete that thought. As, so the instant slope, instant slope at zero at x equals zero. I let this delta x get smaller and smaller. I get the answer zero, which is just what I expected. And you could say, well, not too exciting. But it was an easy one to do. It was the first time that we actually went through the steps of computing. A, this is a, like a delta y. This is the delta x. Instead of 3 over 1, I, starting here, I had delta x squared over delta x, that was easy to see, it was delta x. And if I move in closer, that average slope is smaller and smaller, and the slope at that instant is zero. No problem. The, the, the travel, the climbing began from rest, and, but it picked up speed. The slope here is, not, is certainly not zero. We'll find that slope. We, we need now to find the slope at every point. Okay. So we've got, that, that's a good start. Now I'm ready to find the slope at any point. Instead of just x equals zero, which we've now done, I better draw a new graph of the same, the same picture Climbing up, now I'm putting in a little climb. At some point x here, I'm up at a height x squared. And I'd like to know, at that, I'm at that point on the curve climb, I'd like to know the slope there, at that point. How am I going to do it? I will follow this as the central dogma of calculus, of di differential calculus function one to function two. Take a little delta x. Go as far as x plus delta x. That will take you to a higher point on the curve. That's now the point x plus delta x squared, because our curve is still y x squared. Now, and it's nice, simple parabola. OK, so now I look at distance across and distance up. So delta y is the change up. Delta x is the across. And I have to put what is delta y? I have to write in what is delta y. It's this distance up. It's, it's x plus delta x squared. That's this height. Minus this height, so it's only I'm only I'm not counting this bit, of course. It's that that I want. That's the delta y. Is this piece? So it's up to this. Subtract x squared. That's delta y. Da da. That's important. Now I divide by delta x. This is all algebra now. Calculus is going to come in a moment, but not yet. For algebra, what do I do? I multiply this out. I see that thing squared. I remember that x is squared. And then I have this times this twice, 2x delta x's. And then I have delta x squared. And then I'm subtracting x squared. So that's delta y 
written out in full glory. I wrote it out because now I can simplify by canceling the x squared. I, I'm not surprised. Now, in this case, I can actually do the division. Delta x is just there. So it leaves me with a 2x. Delta x over delta x is 1. And then here's a delta x squared over a delta x, so that leaves me with 1 delta x. People who get, you get, as you get the hang of calculus, you see the important things, the important things is this, like this first order, delta x to the first power. Delta x squared, that, when divided by delta x, gives us this, which is going to disappear. That's the point. This was the average over a short, but still uh, not, not instant uh, range, distance. Now, what happens now dy dx? So if this is short, short over short, this is darn short over darn short. That's that D is the is the it, it, it is well it's too short to see. So I don't actually now try to separate a distance dy. I'm not this isn't a true division. Because dy because it's effectively zero over zero. And you might say, well zero over zero, what what's the meaning? Well, the meaning of zero over zero in this situation is I take the limit, the limit of this one, which does have a meaning. Because those are true numbers. They're little numbers, but they're numbers. And this was this. So now here's the big step leaving algebra behind going to calculus in order to get what's happening at a point i let delta x go to zero and what is that so delta y over delta x is this what is dy dx so in the limit ah it's not hard here's the 2x it's there here is the delta x in the limit, it disappears. So the conclusion is that the derivative is 2x. Okay. I should really, so that's function 2. That's function 2 here. That's the slope function. That's the speed function. Maybe I should draw it. Can I draw it above and then I'll put the board back up? So here's a picture of function 2. The derivative or the slope, which I was calling s. So that's the s function against x. x is still the thing that's varying, or it could be t, or it could be whatever letter we've got. And we want it, and the answer was 2x for this function. So if I graph it, it starts at 0, and it climbs steadily with slope 2. So that's a graph of s of x. And, for example, yeah, so uh, I take a couple of points on that graph. At x equals zero, the slope is zero, right? And we did that first. And we actually got it right. The slope is zero at the start, at the bottom of the curve. At some other point on the curve, what's the slope here? Huh, yeah, tell me the slope there. At that point on the curve, an average slope was 3 over 1, but that was the slope of this, like, you know, uh, sometimes called a chord. That, 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 that's over a big jump of 1. Then I did it over a small jump of delta x, and then I let delta x go to 0, so it was an instant, infinitesimal jump. And what was it? So the actual slope, the way to visualize it is that it's more like that. 
That's the line that's, that's really giving this both a head point. You see my, that's my best picture. It's not Rembrandt, but it's got it. And what is the slope at that point? Well, that's what our calculation was. It found the slope at that point, and at, this, at the particular point x equal 1, the height was 2. The slope is 2. The actual tangent line is only is, is there. You see, it's, it's up, up. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, well, I, yeah, the slope is too, I, I don't know, yeah, maybe, yeah, it goes up to three, it's not right, right, but the math is okay. So what have we done? We've taken the first small step, and literally, I could say small step, almost a play on words, because that's the point, the step is so small to getting these great functions. Before I close this lecture, can I draw this pair, function one and function two, and just see that the, 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 the movement of the curves is what we would expect. So let me just, for one more good example, great example actually, is let me draw, here goes x, I'm going to draw, in fact, maybe I already drew in the first letter, lecture that bit out to 90 degrees. Only if we want a nice formula, we better call that pi over 2 radians. And here's a graph of sine x. This is y, this is function 1, sine x, and what's function 2? What, what can we see about function 2? Again, x. We see a slope. This, this is not the same as x squared. This starts with a definite slope. And it turns out, this will be the, the, one of the most important limits we'll find. We'll discover that the, that the first little delta x which goes up by sine of delta x, has a slope that gets closer and closer to 1. Good. Luckily, cosine does start at 1. So we're OK so far. Now the slope is dropping. And what's the slope at the top of the sine curve? It's a maximum. but. It, we identify that by the fact that the slope is zero because we know the thing, the thing is going to go down here and go somewhere else. The slope there is zero. The tangent line is horizontal. And that is that point. It passes through zero. The slope is dropping. So this is the slope. And the great thing is that it's the cosine of it. And what I'm doing now is not proving this fact. I'm not doing my delta x's. That's the job I have to do once, and it won't be today, but I only have to do it once. And it will tell me, but it, today I'm just saying it makes sense. The slope is dropping. The slope is, in that first part, I'm going up. So the slope is positive, but the slope is dropping. Okay, and then at this point, it hits zero, and that's this point, and then the slope turns negative. I'm falling. So the slope goes negative, and actually it follows the cosine. So I go along here to that point, and then I can continue on to this point where it bottoms out again and then starts up. So where is that on this curve? Well, I better draw a little further out. This bottom here would be the, this is our pi over 2. This is our pi, 180 degrees, everybody would say. 
So what's happening on that curve? The, the function is dropping, and actually it's dropping its fastest. It's dropping its fastest at that point, which is the slope is minus one. And then the slope is still negative, but it's not so negative, and it comes back up to zero at three pi over two. So this is the point three pi over two, and this has come back to zero at, at, at that point, and then it finishes the whole thing at two pi, this finishes up here back at one again. It's climbing. All right, climbing, dropping, faster, slower, maximum, minimum, those are the words that make derivatives uh, important and useful to learn. And we've done in detail the first of our great list of, of functions. Okay, thanks. This has been a production of MIT OpenCourseWare and Gilbert Strang. Funding for this video was provided by the Lord Foundation. To help OCW continue to provide free and open access to MIT courses, please make a donation at ocw.mit.edu slash donate. We thank you, Professor Gilbert Strang, for giving us this wonderful lecture. Now, I have a very simple question for you, and I would like you to put some thinking into it, 25 minutes. Ask yourself, what does it mean by the slope of a particular function at a particular point? Why do we need to find these functions? And what its relationship to our study in this course so far? I'm asking you some very basic questions. All of these questions have already been answered. I just want you to put things into perspective for yourself. Okay? What does it mean by the slope of, at a particular point of a particular functions? Now, for those of you who have the textbook, and if you do not buy the textbook, it's fine with me as long as we have the photocopy of the chapter. Turn back to chapter one, section 1.5, okay? And read the specific sentences over there on page 45, okay? And then carry over to page 46 on the specific idea of the tangent problem, okay? Just not more than five minutes, do a little bit of your thinking before we are going to the second part of today's class. Make sure you have some pauses and make sure you connect the ideas, okay? Yes, sure, you can talk. You can talk with your members next to you. You're free to talk at this point. Ask questions. Do you understand? <coughs>
Here we go. Let's bring back David Jarrison. We cannot watch the following content. Provided in our Creative Commons license. Your support at that MIT Open Courseware continue to see if your answer matches again. Make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses. Visit MIT Open Courseware at mrcw.mit.edu. So, again, welcome to 1801. We're getting started today with what we're calling Unit 1. How we imagine the topic, a highly imaginative title, and it's differentiation. So, let me first tell you briefly what's in store in the next couple of weeks. The main topic today is what is a derivative. And we're going to look at this from several different points of view. And the first one is a, a geometric interpretation. And that's what we'll spend most of today on. And then we'll also talk about a physical interpretation of what a derivative is. And then there's going to be something else which I guess is maybe the reason why calculus is so fundamental and why we always start with it uh, at most science and engineering schools, which is the importance of derivatives of, of this to all measurements. So that means pretty much every place. That means in science and engineering in economics, in uh, political science, etc. Uh, polling, lots of commercial applications, just, just about everything. Now, so that's what we'll be getting started with. And then there's another thing that we're going to do in this unit, which is we're going to explain how to differentiate anything. How to differentiate, how to differentiate any right. function you know. And that's kind of a tall order, but let me just give you an example. If you want to take the derivative, we'll see today is the notation for the derivative of something, of some nested function like e to the x arc tan of x, we'll work this out by the end of this unit. Right? So anything you can think of, anything you can write down, we can differentiate. <coughs> All right, so that's what we're going to do. And today, as I said, we're going to spend most of our time on this geometric interpretation. So let's, let's begin with that. So here we go with the geometric interpretation of uh, derivatives. And what we're going to do is just ask the geometric problem of finding the tangent line. to some graph of some function at some point, which is to say x zero y. So that's the problem that we're addressing here. Um, I guess I should probably turn this off. All right, so here's our problem. And now let me show you the solution. So. Well, 
let's graph the function. So let's say here's its graph, and here's some point. All right. Maybe I should draw it just a bit lower so that I don't. All right. So here's a point P. Maybe it's above the point x0. x0, by the way, this was supposed to be an x0. That was the some fixed place on the x-axis. And now, in order to perform this, this mighty feat, I will um, use another color of chalk. How about red? OK. So, so here it is. Here's the tangent line. Well, not quite straight. Close enough. All right? I did it. All right? That's the end. That's the geometric problem. I achieved what I wanted to do. And uh, it's kind of an interesting question, which unfortunately I can't solve for you in this class, which is how did I do that? That is, how physically did I manage to know what to do to draw this tangent line? But that's what geometric problems are like. Um, we visualize it, we can figure it out somewhere in our brains and habits. And the task that we have now is to figure out how to do it analytically, to do it in a way that uh, a machine could do just as well as I do in drawing this tangent line. So, so what did we learn in high school about what a tangent line is. Well, a tangent line has an equation, and any line to a point has the equation y minus y0 is equal to m the slope times x minus x. So, so here's the, the equation for that line. And now there are two pieces of information that we're going to need to work out uh, what the line is. The first one is the point. That's that point P there. And to specify P given, given x, we need to know the, uh, the, the, the level of y, which is, of course, just f of x0. Now, that's, that's not a calculus problem. But anyway, that's a very important part of the process. So that's the first thing we need to know. And the second thing we need to know is the slope. And that's this number m. And in calculus, we have another name for it. We call it f prime of x0, namely the derivative of f. So that's the calculus part. That's the tricky part. And that's the part that we have to discuss now. So just to make that uh, um, explicit here, I'm going to make a definition, which is that f prime of x0, which is known as the derivative of f at x0 right, is the slope of the tangent line to y equals fx at the point. Uh, uh, let's just call it P. All right. So, so that's what it is. But still, I haven't made any progress in figuring out any better how I drew that line. So I have to say something that's more concrete because I want to be able to cook up what these numbers are. I have to figure out what this number n is. Uh, and one way of thinking about that, let me just uh, try it, is so I certainly am taking for granted this sort of non calculus part that I know what a line to a point is. So I know this equation. But another possibility might be you know, this line here. How do I know? Um, unfortunately, I didn't draw it quite straight. There it is. How do I know that this orange line is not a tangent line, but this other line is a tangent line? Well, it's, it's actually not so obvious. And 
but I'm going to describe it a little bit. It's, it's not really the fact this thing crosses at some other place, which is this point Q, but it's not really the fact that the thing crosses at two places, because the line could be wiggly, the curve could be wiggly, and it could cross back and forth a number of times. That's not what distinguishes the tangent line. So I'm going to have to somehow grasp this, and I first do it in language. And it, it's the following idea. It's that if you take this orange line, which is uh, called a secant line, and you think of the Q, the point Q is getting closer and closer to P, then the slope of that line will get closer and closer to the slope of the red line. And if we draw it close enough, then that's going to be the correct line. So that's really what I did sort of in my brain when I drew that first line. And so that's the way I'm going to articulate it first. Now, so the tangent line is equal to the limit of what's so-called secant lines. PQ as Q tends to P. And here we're thinking of P as being fixed. And Q is very. All right, so, so that's the, the G, again, this is still a geometric discussion. But now uh, we're going to be able to put symbols and formulas to this computation. And we'll be able to, um, to work out uh, formulas in any example. So, so let's do that. So first of all, I'm going to write out these points P and Q again. So maybe we'll put P here and Q here. And I'm thinking of this line through them. I guess it was orange, so we'll leave it as orange. All right. And now I want to compute its slope. And so this will gradually, we'll do this in two steps, and these steps will introduce us to the basic notations which are used throughout calculus, including multivariable calculus, across the board. So the first notation that's used is you imagine here's the x-axis underneath, and here's the x0, the location directly below the point P. And we're traveling here a horizontal distance, which is denoted by delta x. So that's delta x, so-called. And we could also call it the change in x. All right, so that's one thing we want to measure in order to get the slope of this line PQ. And the other thing is this height. So that's this distance here, which we denote delta f, which is the change in f. And then. The slope is just the ratio delta f over delta x. So this is the slope of the, of the secant. And the process I just described over here with this limit applies not just to the whole line itself, but also in particular to its slope. And the way we write that is the limit of this delta x goes to zero, and that's going to be our slope. So this is the slope of the tangent. Okay, now, this is still a little, a little general, and I'm going to, I want to work out a more usable form here. I want to work out a better formula for this. And in order to do that, I'm going to write delta f, the numerator, more explicitly here. The change in f. So remember that the point p is the point x0, f of x0. All right, that's what we got from our formula for the point. And 
In order to compute these distances, and in particular the vertical distance here, I'm going to have to get a formula for Q as well. So if this horizontal distance is delta x, then this location is x0 plus delta x. And so the point above that point has a formula, which is x0 plus, I'm sorry, plus delta x, f of, and this is a mouthful, x0 plus delta x. All right, so there's the formula for the point Q. Here's the formula for the point P. And now I can write a different formula for the derivative, which is the following. So this f prime of x0, which is the same as n, is going to be the limit as delta x goes to 0 of the change in f. Well, the change in f is the value of f at the upper point here, which is x0 plus delta x, and minus its value at the lower point, p, which is x0, divided by delta x. All right, so this is the formula. I'm going to put this in a little box, because this is about far most important formula to say, which we use to derive pretty much everything else. And this is the way that we're going to be able to compute these numbers. So let's, let's do an example. This example, so we'll call this example one. Uh, we'll take the function f of x, which is 1 over x. That's sufficiently complicated to have an interesting answer, and uh, sufficiently straightforward that we can compute the derivative fairly quickly. So, so what is it that we're going to do here? All we're going to do is we're going to plug in this, this formula here for that function. That's, that's all we're going to do. And visually, what we're accomplishing is somehow to take the hyperbola and take a point on the hyperbola and figure out some tangent line. All right, that's what we're accomplishing when we do that. So we're accomplishing this geometrically, but we'll be doing it algebraically. So first, we consider this difference, delta f over delta x, and write out its formula. So I have to have a place, so I'm going to make it again above this point x0, which is a general point. We'll make the general calculation. So the value of f at the top, when we move to the right by f of x, so we'll just read off from this read off from here the, uh, the formula. The first thing I get here is 1 over x0 plus delta x. That's the left-hand term. Minus 1 over x0. That's the right-hand term. And I have to divide that by delta x. Okay, so here's our expression. And by the way, this has a name. This thing is called a difference function. It's pretty complicated because there's always a difference in the numerator, and in disguise, the denominator is a difference because it's the difference between the value on the right side and the value on the left side here. Okay, so now we're going to simplify it by some algebra. So let's just take a look. So this is equal to, let's continue on the next level here. This is equal to 1 over delta x times, now all I'm going to do is put it over a common denominator. So the common denominator 
is x0 plus delta x times x0. And so in the numerator, for the first expression, I have x0. And for the second expression, I have x0 plus delta x. So this is a, the same thing as I had in the numerator before, factoring out this denominator. And here I put that numerator into a, a, this more amenable form. And now there are two basic cancellations. The first one is that x0 and x0 cancel. So we have this. And then the second step is that these two expressions cancel, right? The numerator and denominator. Now we have um, uh, a cancellation that we can make use of. So we'll write that under here. And this is uh, equals minus 1 over x0 plus delta x times x0. And then the very last step is to take the limit as delta x tends to 0. And now we can do it. Before, we couldn't do it. Why? Because the numerator and the denominator gave us 0 over 0. But now that I've made this cancellation, I can pass to the limit. And all that happens is I set this delta x equal to 0, and I get minus 1 over x0 squared. All right, so that's the answer. Right, so in other words, what I've shown, let me put it up here, is that f prime of x0 is minus 1 over x0 squared. Now, uh, let's, let's look at the graph just a little bit to check this for plausibility, all right? Uh, what's happening here is, first of all, it's negative, right? It's less than zero, which is a good thing. You see that slope there is negative. That's the simplest check that you can make. And the second thing that I would just like to point out is that as x goes to infinity, that is, to go farther to the right, it gets less and less steep. So, uh, less and less steep. So, x0 goes to infinity. As x0 goes to infinity, less and less steep. So that's also consistent here. When x0 is very large, it's a smaller and smaller number in magnitude. Okay, we're going to stop here for David's lessons, and I'm going to take attendance for today. And remember, when you come back in first grade, get ready the name of your learning partner. Okay. It's going to be very interesting to watch the key. Thank you. Terry, thank you. Eden, thank you. Jason, thank you. And then Kirkwood, thank you. Don, thank you. Amy, thank you. Susie, thank you. Uh, Bob, thank you. Vivian, thank you. And then Song, thank you. Nietzsche, Nietzsche, thank you. Niwana, thank you. Um, and then Sue, thank you. Pete, thank you. Pete, yeah. Andy, Andy, are you here? Not here today? Okay. Elaine, Elaine, not here today? Okay. And then Kent, thank you. Anson, thank you. Caesar, thank you. Alex, Alex, not yet. Alex, thank you. Tina, thank you. Two hands. Which one is which? Okay. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, Simha, thank you. Kin, thank you. All right. And then Simon, 
Simon in the beginning. Oh, Tim? William. William, are you William? Thank you. Uh, Stephen, thank you. Esther, thank you. Eden, thank you. Um, man, man, are you here? Thanks. All right. Follow thank you. Logo, logo, thank you. Jackie, thank you. Amber, thank you. And lastly, K. All right. Now remember, you need to get all of the environment to get yourself updated to do review on the class lecture. All right. My teacher's message for this week will be up by today. Okay. And you will have to submit your notes together with your very problem according to the schedule to be released today. Okay. I see you on Thursday. Welcome. And hope you have a good lecture today. If you have a question, Write to me through Dr. Mott's Q&A hotline. I will answer you fully well. All right? So that's it for today's MATV 110, Section 1, Calculus 1. From date number 5 on January 19, 2015.